Bless you guys. We are going to um, pick right up in 1 Corinthians, but we're going to get there through 2 Timothy. That's where we're going to start. Um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, this is what it says. All Scripture is God-breathed. That makes it useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And here's what Scripture does for us, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I start here on purpose, and here's why. We've reached the part of 1 Corinthians where it just sounds kind of like Paul's just like giving his random goodbyes and and saying random things, and he just talks about this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And and at the end of every one of his letters, uh, there's there's phrases like, oh, so-and-so says hi. Okay, how does that impact us? What does that do for us? And so we're kind of at this part. In fact, as far as 1 Corinthians goes, we just have this week and next week, and then we will be finished with yet another book of the Bible. And so that will have been Philippians, Matthew, all of Ecclesiastes, John chapter 17, which is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible, and now all of 1 Corinthians. At this rate, I did the math, in 36 years at this current pace, we could preach through the rest of the New Testament. I'll, I'm hopefully, I'll be with Jesus too, Julie. In 36 years. That's just the New Testament. If we sprinkle Old Testament into it, like Ecclesiastes, I will probably never preach through Ecclesiastes again. That was the hardest thing ever. Harder than Revelation by far. That was, wow. Whew. Two weeks, though. And we'll, we'll put 1 Corinthians to bed. And then we're going to launch into First and Second Peter. So we're in this part of Scripture where it just kind of seems like Paul's just kind of winding down and tying up loose ends. And yet, what we see is that the Bible tells us that even these parts of Scripture are useful to help train us in righteousness. They're useful for us as we... Uh, endeavor to position ourselves to be the absolute most useful that we can be in the body of Christ. And so I don't want to just rush over these things. I don't want us to miss anything that's being said. And so uh, we're going to read a couple of verses here in 1 Corinthians 16. But I think that they're pivotal for us. I think that Paul is modeling something that the Bible instructs us to do. And so that's the the, uh, route that we're going to go. That's the way or the lens we're going to see everything through today. Stand with me if you would. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 15 through 18. Read this along with me. He says, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you brothers and sisters to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. Amen. You guys may be seated. And before Paul signs off and ends his letter, he takes time to honor certain people for certain things. And by doing this, he's setting an example for us to follow as an apostle. He's doing something the Bible instructs us to do. In fact, Romans chapter 12 tells us specifically to honor others above ourselves. Honoring people, honoring things, honoring what has come before. These are themes that are central to the scriptures, especially as we get into the New Testament. And so I believe that what Paul was doing in just taking a time at the end of his letter to say, this guy did this, this guy did this. I was sure glad when these guys came. Hey, thank you that you guys did this. And just giving honor to people. That he was fulfilling the words of the scripture and providing an example for us to follow. Here's what we see in this passage. Here's the first thing that we see if you're taking notes. Point number one, we should honor the history that got us where we are. Now Corinth was a a principal city 
in the region of Achaia, which was a Roman province that was basically made up of southern Greece. It was positioned ideally for commerce, for protection, and as such, uh, it was the city where uh, it housed the garrison of troops. It was a, a massive metropolitan area. 800,000 people lived in Corinth proper, and so it was this massive area And as such, the city of Corinth would have provided for the needs of the entire region of Achaia. And what Paul says is that, you know, the church had to start somewhere in that region. So the church in Corinth, they would send people out to the entire region and minister the word of the Lord, minister the gospel, meet the needs of the people in the entire region. And that entire region was positively impacted because the church started somewhere. And where it happened to start was with the family of Stephanus. In verse 15, it says this, You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, the entire region. And they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. The church, um, obviously, well, I mean, in that region it started somewhere, right? It started with them. The church, if we look at a capital C, The church started with Jesus. So when Jesus showed up, started doing ministry on earth, that was the the launching point of the corporate church. Jesus had hundreds of followers that would travel around with him. Twelve of them were the closest followers. They were called disciples. One of them betrayed Jesus and was replaced. Those original twelve disciples, they they became in history the first apostles And then there were other apostles that the Bible mentions like Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Phoebe and Timothy and and there are others. And, And so the apostles were those who were leading other leaders as they established the church of Jesus Christ. So it starts with Jesus and then we can read all throughout the life of Jesus when we can see the beginnings of the church through the book of Acts. Many of these apostles wrote letters to the early church. We can read many of those letters throughout the rest of the New Testament. This is all how the history of the church began. By the year 60 AD, a guy by the name of John Mark who traveled with Paul wrote down the first testament of Jesus' life. And it's because by this point in life, they knew we need a central document that we can circulate around to remind everyone of the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus because Jesus was the beginning of the church. Over the next 50 years, what we see is that there were other people, Matthew, who was a disciple of Jesus. Uh, We see John, who was a disciple of Jesus. We see Luke, who was a physician, also write testaments to the life of Jesus. These became the four gospels that we have in the Bible, and these are central because the church started with Jesus, and so we need to know about Jesus. Now, each of these four authors had different target audiences to whom they were writing. And so, because they're different men with different backgrounds writing to different audiences, they would bring about different and emphasize different parts of the ministry of the life of Jesus. And so, we see some similarities in the stories that are told, and we see some differences in the stories that are told. How the stories are told are different as they prepared their message for their specific target audience. And here's why that was important, because the church started with Jesus. And we need to know about Jesus, and so we've got four gospel messages that tell us about Jesus. As we move on from there, we can see the stories in the book of Acts about the early church. The early Christians were considered criminals by Rome. Rome looked at just the facts of the matter and they had executed Jesus, the leader of the church. And so they viewed anyone that would still follow Jesus as a criminal. They were viewed by the Jewish people as outcasts because they were teaching something different than what the forefathers had taught for years. And so they, they literally were exposed to religious persecution through the Jews, guys like Saul who would literally take people and put them in prison and beat them and kill them for their faith. And they were in danger of uh, political persecution from the nation of Rome as outlaws. 
So they were persecuted, and as they were persecuted, what would happen is the different people would, would travel from place to place to escape persecution. And as they went from place to place, they would share the gospel message with people as they went. And it prevented the church fathers from getting together in a centralized location to kind of talk about, hey, how are we doing these things? And so they would rely on letters and, and people that were taking places, uh, letters to places back and forth. The persecution caused Christians to spread the gospel as they moved throughout the land. By 312 AD, a general in the Roman army had a vision about a Christian symbol. The Christian symbol is comprised of the first two letters of the Latin word for Christ. The vision that he had was unite under this banner. And so he had his troops paint the Christian symbol on their shields, and together they marched on Rome. The general's name was Constantine. Constantine became an emperor of Rome after he defeated it, and he allowed Christians to then worship free of persecution. This allowed the fathers to get together and iron out some of the differences that they had uh, developed in those uh, hundreds of years since the time of Jesus and the time that Christianity finally became legal. The first council that they had, which they had seven, the first council they had was the Council of Nicaea, in which we get the Nicene Creed, which is still recited by some churches even today. The church leaders in this moment, the big debate was, was Jesus God or was Jesus man? And they got together at this a council of Nicaea, and they weighed out all the evidence, and they listened to all the arguments, and they agreed that Jesus is God. And this has been the teaching of the church ever since. Now, this teaching of the church, uh, some people disagree. They, they viewed Jesus as just a mere man who was inspired by God, who was anointed by God, who may have even had the Spirit of God in him, but that he was just man. And from this time, the deity, an attack on the deity, the God nature of Jesus has been present since that time. There are still people that will argue with you about whether or not Jesus was fully God. But the Nicene Council agreed that Jesus was fully God and at the same time, fully man. Around 431 AD, we see the first major split of the church when the Nestorians left after the Council of Ephesus because they thought that Jesus was just a man and not God. Splinter cells continued to argue over points of doctrine until around 1054 AD when the church split into the Roman Catholic or the Western Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, obviously to the East. Both, interestingly enough, both churches to this day will argue that they are the original church and that the other church split away from them, that they didn't split from the, from the other church, that they are the original church and the other church split from them. In 1517, a German priest by the name of Martin Luther wrote his 95 theses or um, objections to the practices of the Catholic church. Since he led a group of people who protested against some of the practices of the Catholic Church, they were labeled Protestants. In 1532, Henry VIII of England wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. The problem was he was already married to Catherine. So he asked the Pope to annul the marriage. The Pope, uh, the Pope declined that request. So King Henry VIII appointed a local priest to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Anglican Church was born. Protestants continued to protest, and by 1609, we had the First Baptist Church in Amsterdam. By 1647, we had the Quakers with an entire movement. By 1738, we had the Methodist Church, and denomination after denomination was born. As we fast forward in 1906, so just a year older than the state of Oklahoma, an African-American pastor in Los Angeles began holding meetings that were a culmination of his personal time of prayer and fasting. These services became known as the Azusa Street Revival. And for over three years, they held three services a day 
seven days a week. This revival was marked by three things. A lack of racial tension as people from all races and backgrounds met together to worship the Lord. A focus on the word of God as the supreme authority. They were less concerned about who taught what because someone taught what. What they wanted to know is what does the Bible say and and predominantly about the Holy Spirit and his role within the church. See, to this point, the churches would teach you that the Holy Spirit's gifts died with the apostles or that they were not available to the people of the day. And, and they just wanted to know because Scripture says that we can, be, we can have access to the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit wants to do things in our life. The Scripture tells us that God is no respecter of persons, that he loves us just as much as he loves the early church fathers. And, and so there's a lot of Scripture. And so they, they had this sort of a, a prick in their heart to return back to the word of the Lord as the supreme authority. The third marked characteristic of this was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit with spiritual gifts operating within the lives of the believers. So we've gone from Jesus to the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. Nearly 170 Pentecostal charismatic denominations and fellowships trace their origins to this revival. Those are two fancy words. Let me explain. Pentecostal means that these Christ followers believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit in which a believer is filled with the literal presence of God for the purpose of being used by God to further his kingdom. There are two groups of these. Uh, One group believes that uh, it is the mark of salvation, that it happens at salvation. The other group believes it happens after salvation, but both would be in agreement that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is available to every believer. Charismatic is a word that means that these Christ followers believe that the gifts of the Spirit, as described in Scripture, are available for believers today and should be practiced not just in the church, but in the everyday lives of the believers. And so Pentecostals believe that you can be filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, and Charismatics believe that the gifts of the Spirit should be functioning within our daily lives. Of those 170 Pentecostal Charismatic denominations and fellowships, uh, there were two that have impacted this church in particular. One of those was the International Pentecostal Holiness Church, and the other was the Assemblies of God. I mention these two in particular because our church uh, in its history has had just two lead pastors. And the fact that we've been in church for 25 plus years and just to have two pastors is, I think, amazing. This church was, fa- was founded by Pastor Joel Downing. I wrote all this not knowing that he would be here today. Pastor Joel, would you stand? Can we honor you? <clears throat> Pastor Joel got his start in the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. Our church has always been independent, Uh, non-denominational, but that's where he got his start in ministry. This church began in a local lady's living room. That's where the church started. And then Pastor Joel was really a cutting-edge mind in several regards He became one of the first mobile churches in our region. Now this is a a common tactic of church plants, uh, but they rented the Bosa Center, which means that they had to have a group of people that showed up early every Sunday morning and set the Bosa Center up to make it ready for people to come to church. And then they had to stay late, which I know how some of y'all like to talk. They had to stay late and replace it, put everything back the way that it was when they got there. And they did that week after week after week, faithful to the Lord so that a church could happen. Then they would uh, later purchase this facility, which this facility that we sit in right now was not a part of the original facility of this property. When you walk in the side doors over here by the nursery, you used to be walking into the sanctuary. 
And with the blessing of the Lord and the vision of the pastor, in the year 2000, they opened up this beautiful sanctuary that we have. And this is built as a gymnasium, which I think is cool. I want a basketball goal over here. In 2016, they opened up the student center, which is the building just uh, next to us. Um, these were all done through the vision of our pastor and the blessing of the Lord. Pastor Joel pastored here for over 20 years in which this church planted literally hundreds of churches across the world. We have a TV in the back. If you've never stopped to look at it, um, there are flags from most of, I haven't updated that uh, since we've been here, but flags of most of the, of the countries in which churches have been planted from this church. Many of them bear the name Higher Ground Church or Crossroads Church, depending on the era in which we planted the church. Hundreds of churches across the world have been planted by this church. In those 20 plus years, they saw hundreds of people saved and their lives radically transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. They saw numerous people called to ministry and released into ministry. Pastors all around in numerous states and numerous towns can trace their lineage, their salvation experience, their call to ministry back to this church. In fact, three called and released to ministry in this town, two of which still pastor churches that are affecting positive change in the kingdom of God right here in Paul's Valley. I got my start in the Assemblies of God. Amanda and I have served here as pastors for the last seven and a half years. We've continued to plant churches through a partnership with Surge Ministries. We've continued to see people saved and radically transformed by the power of the gospel, and by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Our goal is to be a body of believers who love people and live the Bible. Amanda and I believe that the more biblically literate we are as a people, the more usable by God we are, and therefore, the more we can push back the darkness with the light of the gospel. The lives being changed right now would not be possible if there were not a long line of believers, Pastor Joel, all the way back to the original 12 disciples, who were unwilling to say yes to Jesus. Did you guys know that we have a story in Scripture that tells us that instead of the 12 disciples, it could have been the 13? There was a rich young ruler that approached Jesus and started a conversation with him, and Jesus made him the same offer that he made the 12 disciples. Come, follow me. But that young man said no and walked away. But 12 of the 13 said yes. And that model of saying yes to the Lord was something that people from that time with Jesus, literally physically on the earth up until now, have continued as we continue to say yes. And because there's been a lineage of people who continue to say yes to the Lord, people's lives are being changed and impacted with the gospel right now in Paul's Valley, America, at Crossroads Church. I think it's important for us to do what the Bible instructs us to do, to honor those who come before we should honor the history that got us where we are, just like Paul stopped and said, it was the household of Stephanus where it all started. Honor these people. Here's the second thing that we learn. We honor those who currently work for the cause of Christ. Paul took special care to mention a few people by name. Whether Paul realized it at the time or not, the Holy Spirit who was inspiring this moment knew that these men's names would be recorded in Scripture as an example for us for history. 
He says in verse 15 and 16, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I I want us to note that separation. He says, those who join in the work and labor at it. It's one thing to join in the work by saying yes and amen. It's another thing to join in the work and labor at it. And what he's saying is submit to those who join in the work and labor at it. They don't just join by saying, hey, go get them, Tiger. That's a great job. Really proud of you guys out there. They join in the work by saying yes and amen. And because yes and amen, I will do. And he says when people engage in the work For the cause of Christ, we're to humble ourselves to them. We're to submit to them. We're to honor them for their work. Here's the the third thing that we learn. And then we're going to talk kind of about both of those simultaneously. We honor those who give to support the work that they cannot do themselves. Not everyone is called to be a missionary in Irkutsk. Irkutsk. It's a fictionary uh, country by the Ural Mountains in the game of Risk. You can pick the normal country or the fictionary country, whichever you like, of your choosing. And not everyone is called to go be a missionary. Not everyone is called to be a pastor. Not everyone is called to teach the word of God. And in fact, the Bible says that we shouldn't even want that because these people are held to a higher standard when they stand in front of the throne of God. Not everyone has that calling on their lives, but everyone does have the calling on their lives to support the work of the ministry and to further the kingdom of God. And we do that primarily in two ways. First of all, our own personal experience that we have as we live lives that that honor God. And secondly, through the way that we give resources and target resources for the expansion of the gospel and the kingdom of God. And he says that we need to honor those people. In three weeks, we will host Adult Teen Challenge from Lawton, Oklahoma. You will have an opportunity to provide financial resources to people who are engaged in helping men overcome life-controlling addictions. Now, you may not have that skill set, and you may not want that skill set. As a, as a therapist, uh, this is kind of comical uh, when you're in grad school, they always say, who are you going to work with? What modality are you going to use? And they make you choose, right? And I would always say, I don't know. I, I won't work with kids. And that was my 97% of my caseload for majority of my counseling career. I won't work with kids, I would say. And um, I, I did. And then I would say, I don't want to work with drugs and alcohol. I have no desire to do that. I still to this day have no desire to do that. And yet, where did I find myself? So, I mean, you may be looking at this kind of a ministry going, hard pass. And that's fine, because not everybody is called to this. Some are. And the way that we honor those, these are how these two things work in concert. The way that we honor those who are called and actively engaged in the work and the, of the ministry, the cause of Christ, how we honor those is by supporting them and making it able for them to do that. And there are certain ministries like this where it's a whole lot easier to write a check than it is to go get involved. And we're not supposed to feel bad for the fact that, hey, listen, all I did was cut a check. No, we honor those people who make the ministry work. And these two things, they work hand in hand. In October, I believe, uh, we're going to be hosting a missionary to Africa. This is a friend of mine. Uh, He runs an organization that feeds kids. In fact, uh, kids are home from school right now, and uh, and that means that they're not being fed by their school. We have the same problem here in America. 
Um, but he's going to be here in October. You're going to have an opportunity to support someone that is doing the work overseas. You can do that right now. If you're like, I'll feed kids in Africa. Come find me after church, and I will explain to you how you can do that. I will connect you with these people. There are, there are hungry kids, right? Like, listen, you don't have to go to Africa, right? You don't have to drive to Lawton to find people who are addicted to life-controlling substances. We have right here in our church, the Hedge House, a ministry in Winniewood, America, where you can support them as they help. It's a, a, a sober living house, so as they're coming out of full-time inpatient treatment, they have a place to go to help them transition back into the real world. You, you could, we have starving kids. We have homeless. Uh, our homeless population in Paul's Valley, our adolescent and child homeless population in Paul's Valley is high statistically. This is an issue. It's an issue right here in our town. And you don't have to go a long ways to help. You could say, Pastor Brock, I'd like to feed kids. And we'll say, okay, and connect you with people who feed kids. We feed kids as a church. We take snacks to the library, and it's something we do from time to time. And we do that, why? Because kids show up at the library and they're hungry. And they know that as long as they show up at the library, there's at least some peanut butter crackers, and that may be more than what they're getting at home. There are, uh, there are organizations that we uh, support locally where you can go work at this organization, like the food pantry in town. The numbers of people that they give food to on a regular basis are high. And they need people to go take the box of food and put it in somebody's trunk. They need somebody to help them organize and label so they know how to get the boxes of food put together. These are organizations that are right here local that we work with as a church where you don't have to, you don't have to be, if, if I said write a check and you're like, well, I'm out on that, I can't do that. No, you can still give. It doesn't have to be writing a check. You can give to enable those who are called to do ministry the ability to do the ministry. It may be your time. It may be your resources. It may be your intelligence. It may be your physical strength. Whatever it is, you can give. And here's what the Bible says. We honor those who do the work, and we honor those who give to support the work that they can't do themselves. If you would say, man, I would love to go help uh, feed people, but I don't know how to do that. Listen, you can't do that on your own. We have people. Let's connect you with the people. I would, I would love to go minister to kids in Africa, but I don't even, I mean, what do I just buy a plane ticket? No, you don't do that on your own. We have people, we connect you with people. We honor those who do the work. We honor those who give to the work. And that system of honoring is born out of the fact that we honor those who came before that are the reason that we're here doing the things that we can do. Listen to what he says in verses 17 and 18. I want to mention two, three more things before I move on. You can give if you're like, eh, libraries, the library, they're publicly funded. Fine. You can give to Crossroads students. you can give to Crossroads Kids. Like you can support real ministry to real children through your church. Now, this is over and above normal tithe, right? Because we, we fund these activities. But if you say, hey, I'd love for you to be able to do other things, additional things and beyond what your budget is allowed, then you can give money above your tithe to these right here in our church. There's another thing that you can do. Uh, in the back is still a sign-up sheet for our security team. And that's something simple that you can do while you're at church anyway. Giving of your time and your abilities to say, hey, I want to make sure that people feel safe when they come into the house of the Lord. And so these are, these are areas where you can serve, where you can give 
to make sure that people who are called to do the work are able to do the work. This is what he says in verses 17 and 18. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived. Achaicus, what a name. He's from Achaia. Achaicus from Achaia. Be like naming your child Oklahoman from Oklahoma. He says, I was glad when they arrived because they supplied what was lacking from you. Here's what, that's apostle speak, for they brought me an offering. Thank you. I was glad when they got here because there were some things that were lacking and you supply, your offering supplied those needs. You guys met needs by sending me the offering that you sent me with these guys. And this is what he says, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours also. What does giving do? Giving doesn't just enable people to go out and do the work of the Lord. It is a blessing for those who give as well as those who use the gifts. And he says, thank you for this. I was glad when they came. I was glad when they refreshed my spirit and it refreshed your spirit to be able to supply these needs. I want you to know that needs were met by your gifts. It helped Paul and it blessed those who gave. So we don't just honor those who do the work. We don't just honor those who are up front. We don't just honor those people with a microphone. We don't just honor the people with a YouTube channel. We don't just honor the people with a platform. We honor those who give to support the work of the Lord. Here's my, my closing question, but I've got two different applications of it. Here's my closing question. Where do you want to fit in the history of the church? because you're a part of the history of the church. If we do our jobs right, in 20 plus more years, there's gonna be more people that are able to look back and say the ministry being done right now in 2044 is only being done because of the lineage of people who are able to help, who said yes to Jesus. Where do you wanna fit into the history of the church? And then here's my, my, my two different applications of it. Are you called to be a doer? Or are you called to provide for the doers? How do you want to fit into the history of the church? Are you called to be a doer or are you called to provide for the doers? Because those are the two veins that he gives us right here in this passage. We want to honor those actively engaged in the work. We want to honor those who give their resources to enable those who are actively engaged into the work. Those are our categories. Where do we want to fit? And it may be both, but it can't be neither. Well, pastor, I don't have physical strength. I don't have a big checkbook. I don't have, listen, can you pray? Can you believe in faith? Can you fast? Can you encourage people? Can you work a text message? If not, can you write a card? Like you can give. You have value. You can add something to the kingdom of God. You can do. And if you're called to do, let us know. We want to help you do the things that you're called to do. Sometimes that's releasing you into ministry. Sometimes that's connecting you with the people that you need connections with. Sometimes that's us saying, man, praise God, we've been praying and asking the Lord to send someone to do that. How do you want to fit into the history of the church? Do you want to be a doer? Do you want to be a provider of those who do? I'd like you to stand with me. We're going to close the service in prayer. It takes those that are called to do and those that are called to provide. It takes both saying yes to continue the history of the church into the future of the church. It takes both saying yes, both being willing to say, I'll do that. It takes both of those groups saying yes in order for the church to be successful and what God has put in our hearts to do. I'm going to pray over us, and, and the, the questions were not rhetorical. They beg answers, but the answers are for you and your own heart. 
And so I'm going to pray over us that God would cement in you what you are to do. Be a doer, be a provider. And that he's going to lead you in that so that we can help you find your fit within his kingdom. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for providing uh, even in these um, Last remarks from the Apostle Paul in a letter to a church that were his friends. In a way that he could just say, hey, by the way, I was glad when you sent these people to me. Thank you for that. In a way that 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 helps us understand a culture of honor that we're to have as your people and the things that we're supposed to do and how we fit within your kingdom by identifying the, the, the people that we honor. And God, I just, I thank you for this history of our church, the rich history. I thank you for Pastor Joel and for Pastor Donna. I thank you for all the, the people that have done ministry at this church, whether they've been on staff full time, whether they've been a volunteer. God, I praise you for those that have done ministry here. I praise you for those that have supported the work of this church so that it can continue to this day. God, we honor those who have done the work. We honor those who have provided for the work. And God, we pray that you would help us as we discern what you want from us. Are we doers? Are we providers? Are we both? And God, as you cement that within our hearts, I pray that that would be something that the enemy cannot shake within us that we begin to identify ourselves by what you're calling us to do and to be, and that that is who we will become. God, I pray over the current ministry of this church and those that are engaged in the work that you would bless them. I pray for those who support the ministry of this work so that those of us that do can do it. God, that you would bless them. We just pray your favor would remain as we continue our commitment to you and to expanding your kingdom. God, we thank you for this. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen.